It's The Real News Network. I'm Greg Wilpert in Baltimore. Former Vice President Joe Biden is ahead in the polls, and pundits often claim that the reason for this is that Biden is the more electable of the Democratic candidates. But is he? Bernie Sanders recently pointed out that opinion polls regularly indicate that the U.S. electorate's policy preferences are more closely aligned with progressive policies, such as universal health care and free public college, but not with the supposedly more moderate policies of Joe Biden. But exactly what are Biden's policies and what is his record? This is an issue that the debates and analysts rarely examine in much detail. A recently published book with the title Yesterday's Man, The Case Against Joe Biden by Branko Marcetic does just that. Branko joins me now for part two of my interview with him. Thanks again, Branko, for being here today. No, it's great to be here. So in the first part of this interview, we looked at Biden's civil rights, ju racial justice, and environmental policy record. In the second part, I want to focus on his economic and foreign policies. Now, with regard to Biden's economic policy record, he was an early supporter of the shift towards neoliberalism already during the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Talk about the main, main economic policies that he has championed throughout his career from fiscal policy to trade policy. Uh, yeah, from 1978 onwards, uh, Biden became one of the leading Democrats calling for this uh, kind of Reagan light approach to, to uh, budgetary policy. Uh, you know, he, he ran in 78 as a fiscal conservative. He called for a massive tax cut. He wanted um, the, uh, a limit to the, uh, the, the, the size of federal bureaucracy. He even put forward sunset legislation um, that would basically make every government program automatically uh, phase out unless it was uh, manually renewed, and, uh, you know, specifically each one. Um, and so uh, that was really the, the path he followed for the next uh, several decades. Through the 80s, he was constantly calling for uh, the government to do something about the, the, the big deficit and the big uh, spending in, in Washington. He was really in many ways trying to outdo Reagan. Um, he would, uh, for example, when Reagan put forth a spending freeze, uh, Biden put forth his own spending freeze with, with a couple of other Republicans. Um, that was even more, uh, that was even bigger than, than Reagan's and, and put Medicare and Social Security on the table as well. Uh, through the 90s, he was constantly talking about the, the, the need to attack spending and the deficit. He voted for the balanced budget constitutional amendment three years in a row, um, despite himself acknowledging every single time that it would be a disaster and that was it was a terrible idea. Um, he voted for it each time because, uh, you know, part of Biden's career is that he, he feels the need to constantly uh, posture and show the public that he is just as much of a conservative and can, can be just as right wing and 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 push all these kind of same pro corporate policies as Republicans can. Um, and we saw that even under under Obama when he was vice president. Um, you know, Biden's task under Obama was one to um, uh, root out you know fraud and, and so called waste from the uh, stimulus. Um, what and what that really meant was get rid of programs that. Were maybe useful job uh, creating uh, programs, but uh, could be picked up by Republicans and sort of made fun of and and used to attack Obama, and and that was his whole thing. You know, on the a month before uh, the sh the famous shellacking the Democrats and Obama took uh, in 2010, uh, Biden gave Obama his. Um, uh, you know, the, the, how much he had saved uh, through all this uh, rooting out of fraud and waste and that kind of thing. And it was this, in the grand scheme of things, not a very large amount. And it was this very proud thing for Biden. But, you know, uh, it showed that <laughs> given the, the size of the Democratic loss in 2010, the public really didn't care about this. Uh, th this wasn't a priority for actual uh, Americans, for actual working Americans. It was a priority for the political class that Biden came out of, but that's it. And then that's the same thing with the trade issues. I mean, um, Biden, despite having a lifelong link to organized labor, uh, despite getting a lot of support from unions from the very beginning of his career to, to really even now, um, you know, he uh, ended up pushing uh, and voting for NAFTA, not just to give Bush uh, the, the, the fast track authority to negotiate it, but then under Clinton to, to ratify it, this major, major betrayal of labor. Um, and, you know, just similar to, to uh, the support that we're seeing uh, from African-Americans that Biden is getting now, it's a similar thing with labor, where labor, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure people know that his actual record on, on labor is not very good. He actually 
got one of the lowest uh, ratings from the AFL-CIO consistently through the 1980s, um, about the same as, as Gary Hart, who was a famously anti-Labour uh, Democrat. Um, and yet Labour has been very loyal to him despite this and despite things like pushing for NAFTA, despite things like pushing for the TPP uh, under Obama, which he has said that he still supports, um, a, you know, which is remarkable if we're talking about electability, um, to, to be uh, you know, still supporting TPP um, while facing up or potentially facing up against Donald Trump in the general election. Mm -hmm. Now, another area where Biden seems to have stood out is in his support for uh, the reform of bankruptcy law and against financial regulation. Now, he represents the state of Delaware, which is notorious for being a tax haven and a corporate incorporation paradise. Uh, how has that fact influenced his policies on the financial in industry? Well, there was the bankruptcy bill, of course, that uh, made it a lot harder for uh, middle and working class families to discharge their debts. Um, and it's been devastating for, for students who are grappling with student debt. Um, and that was pushed by uh, MBNA, which is a credit card company uh, in, in um, Delaware. And also it has to be uh, understood that Delaware, because it's this uh, bankruptcy haven, um, it, a large part of its business, its local industry, really is bankruptcy. And so uh, pushing this bill that was terrible um, for many, many, many people across the United States was good technically for the Delaware economy, and it was good for the people who contribute to Biden's campaigns. Uh, of course, MBNA is the credit card company that was his biggest contributor. They pushed the, that bill, as well as some other things like the repeal of Glass-Steagall, uh, which Biden also voted uh, for. Um, uh, but, you know, Biden has, has beyond that worked to protect, uh, you know, the status that Delaware has. Uh, when a group of um, uh, uh, people tried to push what was called the Delaware killer in the 90s um, in, in Congress, uh, which was this attempt to shift, um, to, to, to end Delaware's favorability as a, as a site of, of bankruptcy for corporations because it was so, so, so friendly to them. Biden both times put up such a vehement fight against this that um, that uh, the effort was killed. Uh, you know, one lawmaker just threw up his hands and said, okay, well, you know, I, don't want to, I don't want to go up against this. Um, so I think it's, yeah, but, uh, Delaware's status as his corporate haven has been really crucial to understanding some of Biden's votes. But not just that, but, you know, also the um, the presence of the DuPont company, um, which uh, has dominated that state for decades and, um, well, well, really even longer than decades, centuries, really. Um, and uh, it, Biden drew a lot of his staffers from DuPont when he was first elected. He, he sort of had this very um, friendly relationship with them because you, you sort of had to if you were an elected official in Delaware. So I think that's also uh, helps to explain some of his uh, corporatist uh, leadings over the years. Hmm. Now, finally, turning to foreign policy, uh, Biden seems to have a bit of a mixed record in this regard. That is, on the one hand, in the 1970s, he opposed the Vietnam War, the embargo, uh, and the U.S. embargo on Cuba, but and also the Reagan's wars on Central America. But then also he um, argued against uh, Obama's troop surge in Afghanistan. But in the 1990s, he became more hawkish in other aspects. Talk about this transition and about where he stood on issues of U.S. military intervention uh, over the decades. Well, this is what we were talking about before. You know, Biden isn't someone with a very substantive ideology. I think he's just someone who has always wanted to be in power. You know, he always wanted to be president and, and senator from a very young age. And everything has been about that for him. Um, and so uh, you're exactly right. Same as he was a New Deal liberal in the 1970s, um, he was also something of a, of a dove on the Vietnam War because that was the prevailing mood at the time. Um, he, he actually, in his initial speech, announcing his campaign for Senate, he didn't even mention the Vietnam War despite speaking for 40 minutes. Um, and they had to, uh, basically reporters had to ask him about it. And it was only then that he really developed this anti-war stance that he took uh, into the next few years. But by the 80s, in the same way that Reagan's victories had uh, really led Biden and other Democrats like him to reconsider the direction of the party on domestic policy and economics and that kind of thing, uh, those victories also led Biden to rethink his stance on foreign policy because he said, clearly, voters want someone who is more aggressive, who is more willing to use force overseas, and Democrats are, are you know, going to lose if we don't embrace this philosophy more and more. And so in the 80s, he really uh, pushes for 
uh, or, or at least actually supports a number of uh, military interventions. He supports uh, Reagan's bombing of Libya and his invasion of Grenada. He supports Bush's uh, invasion of Panama. He opposes the Gulf War. Um, but when it ends up being a, a big political triumph for Bush, he completely reverses it. He says, you know what, I was wrong. Uh, credit where credit's due, Bush was, had courage to push this war that killed hundreds of thousands of kids. And so he, um, through the 90s, ends up being um, much more hawkish on the world stage, where Republicans are actually less so in that decade. He's pushing for involvement in, in you know, Bosnia and, and Kosovo, and actually by the end is even calling for... Uh, Saddam's ouster. And that leads us to the, the, the moment in 2002 when Biden spends the entire year uh, as chairman of the federal uh, of the of the Foreign Relations Committee pushing for uh, war with Iraq, which, uh, of course, he ends up voting for and, and, and ends up getting. And, and you're right, uh, under Obama, he did take less um, interventionist uh, uh, positions on things like Libya and, and the surge of Afghanistan. Um, and that's commendable. Uh, I think it also shows the way that Biden just kind of goes along with whatever he feels that the prevailing political attitude is. I think it's also important to note that at the same time that he did take these these more laudable stances, he was also the, the person who created the, or came up with the idea of the, the counterterrorism plus strategy, which is what Obama did, which is basically, instead of invading with boots in the ground, just bomb them remotely from, from drones and, and planes and, you know, send in special forces every now and then to come in and, and you know, raid some house and, and kill someone. Um, and that strategy has not only helped to um, completely undermine the, the gains in, in, in world opinion that Obama had engendered through his, uh, through his election, and 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 fuel the the kind of uh, anti-Americanism and 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 then, uh, terrorism that that Obama had come in trying to end, um, but also it is now it, that program ended up in the hands of Donald Trump, you know, and we saw the danger of this where not only has Trump stepped up all of these things, he stepped up drone attacks and everything. But also, he um, used the drone to assassinate a foreign leader in the form of uh, General Soleimani, which nearly caused a war in the Middle East. And that is a really important legacy of the strategy that Biden cooked up. And if Trump wins another term, you know, he's going to have these expansive and dangerous powers at his disposal for another four years. And then who knows uh, who, who will come after him to have the, the same powers. Mm. Now, unfortunately, we can't actually go through all of these uh, policy areas. We've covered a lot of ground. There's some that we had to skip, such as immigration and uh, Biden's role in the uh, confirmation hearings of Supreme Court justices. But we're going to have to leave it there. But let me, before we conclude, I just want to briefly try to see if we can summarize uh, this political portrait of Joe Biden. That is, uh, you know, more recently he's been trying to portray himself as a progressive. Now, would you say that he has actually become more progressive? You've mentioned before that he doesn't really have a clear political ideology. So then uh, is he continuing to just read the sign of the times, in other words, acting uh, opportunistically, opportunistically? I mean, how would you characterize this briefly? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Biden, if you look at his career, he has uh, always been, uh, had a tendency to just say whatever he needed to say. You know, he, he called himself, he said, I'm not a liberal in the 1970s. I'm not that liberal. People think I'm a liberal, but I'm actually quite conservative in things. And he, he would repeat that through the years. Um, Biden has also, you know, he said a lot of things about his life that aren't true. He said that he was a civil rights activist for years and years uh, until that was proven to be a lie. Um, he started saying that again now. He said he was an anti-war activist uh, for years. That was also a lie. Um, he, he is now saying that, you know, he got arrested trying to meet up with Nelson Mandela in South Africa, which is uh, probably a lie. He's lying about his Iraq war record. He's saying... Uh, lately in, in, in the last uh, however many debates that, that when the Iraq war started, he immediately went into opposition mode, slightly contradicted by the record. And there's no way that he doesn't know that this is untrue. So, I mean, Biden, even even if you look at the social issues that Democrats have, have moved left on, even as they've stayed economically and, and uh, otherwise conservative, Biden has always been lagging behind on that. I mean, it took until 2019 for him to, to oppose the Hyde Amendment that uh, uh, is a huge restriction on abortion rights in the U.S. Um, and that has been his position throughout his entire career. So, uh, I mean, Biden really has been a conservative Democrat his entire life, and not just a conservative Democrat, but a conservative Democrat who 
any time the right wing in the United States um, does anything or, or, or moves to the right, becomes more radical, Biden moves with them. That, that's his only way of combating them. And again, you know, as, as we watch the Republican Party lurch ever rightward into, into a more uh, concerning direction, we have to really think about what it's going to be like to have someone like Joe Biden either campaigning in that atmosphere or uh, even, even governing in that atmosphere. Yeah, I think it's really crucial what you're saying, characterizing him as a conservative Democrat instead of just saying that he's a moderate. I think that's probably much more honest to say, a conservative Democrat. But we're going to have to leave it there for now. I was, uh, I was speaking to Branko Marcetic, author of the book Yesterday's Mang, The Case Against Joe Biden. I highly recommend it. Thanks again, Branko, for having joined us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thank you for joining the Real News Network. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.